FM News Talk 97.1. On Demand Audio. So right now we're going to welcome Shamid Dogan, who is actually... Um, the member of the House of Representatives from the 98th District. He's been serving since 2015. He's also a member of the Republican Party, and I'm so happy to welcome him to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Hey, Stacey. Glad to be here. Thank you for having uh, the time on a Sunday evening to talk to us. Um, so you were going to give us a, kind of an update, local rundown of what's going on down in Jeff City. Sure. Um, we are preparing for our veto session uh, in late September. And um, it's going to be a pretty exciting one. Um, we have a Second Amendment bill that we're going to be uh, discussing whether or not to override, as well as voter ID. Those are kind of the big ticket items. Um, but there's also kind of some lesser known items, like a bill that we passed called the Big Government Get Off My Back Act, which I would assume your viewers, your listeners would love, um, as well as some other things related to agriculture and taxes. Well, let's first delve into the 2A issue. You're In the veto override session, you have the opportunity to resurrect a bill that the uh, current do-nothing governor, Jay Nixon, has uh, kind of basically said, I'm not, this won't work for me. What was the bill? Um, so what it was, it has a few different elements in it. Um, one of them um, is called constitutional carry, um, which essentially says that um, if you do have the right to carry a concealed weapon, um, that you don't need a permit for that any longer. Um, right now we have a permitting process where you have to um, take classes and all that, um, and you don't actually have to do that for open carry, um, oddly enough. Um, so this would just set the parameters of uh, concealed carry to be the same as open carry. Um, and there's another... Wait, 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 wait. It. it would... So we would no longer have to go through that lengthy process where you wait for six weeks to get your little card back? No, you no longer would have to go through the permitting process. Um, like I said, but you don't, you already don't have to do that to carry open. I, I don't know how many people realize that. Well, I know that, but carrying open has its own deterrent, which is depending on what you look like, you're worried that the police will take you down to the ground and tase you or that people will run <laughs> screaming from the grocery store. I know in Alaska, it's no big deal. We were at the subway. Dude ahead of us had a big 40, uh, I think it was a 1911 right on his waist and he ordered his sandwich and we ordered ours and nobody said anything. And he was open carrying in Alaska. But here in Missouri, I see it so rarely. I mean, it's just like you never see it. Yeah, especially here in kind of urban or suburban areas. You know, I think moms mostly would be kind of freaked out if you saw somebody open carrying in a Starbucks. Well, you can't open carrying a Starbucks because they have the dumb sign. <laughs> well, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then, so so that, that, so it's the component of removing the lengthy registration process, which means, like, when you go to get your concealed carry class, let's say you took it Saturday of last week. Mm -hmm. So not yesterday, but Saturday of last week. So it's been seven days. Well, if you didn't turn it in on Monday of this past week, the Monday that just went by, it, it's six weeks from the day you actually sit there in that office, the St. Louis County uh, Police, it's the sheriff's office right down uh, in Clayton. If you sit there for the however long it takes and get your stuff turned in and get your fingerprints taken, and then they go through the process, it's six weeks from then. And you have to pay, of course. Um, this would remove all of that. Right. And th there has been a lot of pushback on this law, not just from your kind of typical gun control advocates, but also from... Um, sheriff's departments and other law enforcement um, agencies across the state. Um, the sheriffs are concerned that this would take them out of the process entirely since they would no longer be able to deny people um, the right to a permit based on record or based on kind of any other um, public safety concerns that they have. Mm. Um, so that's something that a lot of us have been watching. And then the other part of the bill that's going to be pretty controversial um, is that it would uh, enact stand your ground. Um, where you would say that people have a right to defend themselves, not just in their home, which is kind of covered under the castle doctrine, mm -hmm. not just in someone else's home where you have a right to be, but anywhere, you know, whether it's a public place, whether it's a private place, um, the language of the bill says anywhere that you have a right to be, you have the right to defend yourself. Hmm. Interesting. Now, you supported this legislation. I voted for it, uh, yes, when we went through kind of the regular process. Um, but I'm kind of having some second thoughts now that I've heard these concerns from law enforcement. Um, and really, the, the stand your ground part gives me a lot of heartburn um, because it's it's not just in the, you know, the theoretical aspect of it. It's in how the law is applied. You know, I want to make sure that, you know, we don't end up being like the stereotype that people always accuse uh, Second Amendment supporters of, which is 
being able to kind of shoot first and then ask questions later. Mm. I I, I really need to have those questions resolved. I would like to have them resolved, but I, I, I don't know if you listened to the show, but last Sunday night we talked about how gun owners, concealed carry certified gun owners, are actually less likely to commit a crime than police officers. They actually did a statistical study on that. Um, and I'll have to tweet it out again tonight if you want to see the link. It's it's actually this, some of the safest people on the planet are people who have concealed carry licenses. I don't know that I'm against the Stand Your Ground law. I know I'm not for it as a proponent per se, but I do think we need to have more substantial discussions about it. And um, is that likely to happen between now and the veto session? It's that's going to be the most hotly contested, Stacey. Um, I think the voter ID law is pretty assured of passage. Oh, we're going to really get that. Heard many Republicans mm. having second thoughts about that, but okay. this, this law because it does have both of those elements. Um, and I think when you combine the stand your ground part with eliminating the training that people have to go through right now to get a concealed carry license, because um, I think one of the main reasons that people are, you know, responsible gun owners is because they do have to undergo safety training and kind of training on the use of force. And if you no longer have to undergo that training telling you when it's justified to use your weapon and when it's not, then, you know, you get kind of worried that people will go out and, you know, be irresponsible. I have to say, for my part, I don't think that's a good component to this. I, I'm all for the removal of the six-week wait, six waiting period to get the actual license. I, I'm mm-hmm. not for removing the um, the training. I feel like that training was, it was exactly what I needed to go out and feel confident about being a concealed carry certified individual. And I, I don't know if you ever go to Bearing Arms, but the editor of Bearing Arms is, is adamant about the fact that if you if all you have under your belt is a CCW training class that was eight hours on one day, you're not even really ready to carry at that point. You need to go get some crack training, you know, civilian response training and some other things like that under your belt before you feel confident in carrying a concealed weapon. And I agree with it completely. I think you you can never be trained enough, but people who have hundreds of hours of training say that the one one day class isn't enough. And it's what we have as our standard, so I wouldn't want to see the standard changed, but I would in, right. I would encourage them to say during the class, look, you need more training. This gets you your concealed carry license. You need to be in here at the range, and you also need to have other forms of training in here so you can understand when you're supposed to be using this thing because, you know, it, it, we both know this. It's someone's life that we're talking about. That's right, and there, there's so much good in this bill. Um, that, that you mentioned, but it's it's like any other legislation that we do have to deal with. You have to weigh the pros and the cons, and it's not always easy answers, you know. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, so that okay, okay. So that's that. You're saying the uh, the voter ID is a, is a, is good to go. So yes. I shouldn't be concerned um, that pansies are going to cause that to flake out. Right, because there's two parts to it. The voter ID provisions that we passed. Um, first of all, they're the most generous in the nation. Um, for these civil rights groups to be talking about voter disenfranchisement when they totally ignored the actual voter disenfranchisement we had in St. Louis County, by the way. But um, this law doesn't disenfranchise anybody, um, and it has to be approved by the voters, first and foremost, for this even to take effect. Um, And what they're not realizing is that Missouri is going to be the only state that provides for free IDs for people who don't have them already, but we're also going to provide for free drivers, I mean, for free birth certificates, um, as well as any other identity document that you need to get a uh, a non-driver's ID, huh. which no other state has right now. Okay, and that would be, to me, kind of like uh, us forging the way. Show me state, uh, you know, shows you that every public document that has to do with your verification of citizenship or, or voting rights should be provided to you by your government free of charge. That's amazing. I, and it removes all of the barriers that have previously been touted by Democrats as reasons why we need to not have voter ID. I love it. Exactly. I, I think that's fantastic. Okay, so what else? We, you talked about the 2A, the uh, voter ID, and that's in the, um, the override session. Is there any, uh, any other bill that's going to come up during the override session? Those are going to be the most controversial. There's also some spending items. Um, the governor vetoed, as he does every year, um, some funding for uh, brain injury uh, victims, which um, I could make a joke there, but I will refrain from it. Um, but needless to say. <laughs> I think um, I got the, the essence of it. I might have. I might have. <laughs> yeah. These are folks who are seriously in need, and you would think that we would be prioritizing people who have very serious health care needs. 
um, who, without the government funding, wouldn't be able to, you know, recover from this very serious uh, traumatic brain injury. And he keeps vetoing this every year as, like, his example of how he's going to show fiscal discipline, as if there's not enough waste in all kinds of other government programs that he could have vetoed. Yeah, um, I'd love to see him get some of that other waste and, and crap out of there and, and create some surplus dollars so we can stop. Uh, I'm so tired of MoDOT, the way they talk about how they don't have any money and how long it takes them to complete projects. It's just amazing to me that uh, that's not a subject that we should even get to, into. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, we, <laughs> we, we should stay on topic. There'd, <laughs> there'd be plenty to discuss. Right, sure. right. Um, so are you, are you up for re-election right now? Are you running now? I am. I'm up again in November. I have a Democratic opponent. Okay. And my campaign's going well. I thankfully have a pretty conservative district um, out in West County. And what is your, what is your campaign website? It's shameddogan.com, and that's S-H-A-M-E-D-D-O-G-A-N. Okay. Shameddogan.com. Um, and then what are you looking for? Are you looking for people to get signs, or are you, are you wanting people to donate? What, what are your most pressing needs between now and November? Um, primarily just to get people who live in my district active in terms of volunteering, um, because I am a, a pretty big team player. I want to get across all of our statewide candidates, you know, from Eric Schmidt for treasurer, um, who is my state senator right now. Um, I'm a huge supporter of his, um, all the way up to, you know, attorney general, lieutenant governor, governor, all those candidates are going to need good turnout in the Republican areas like mine. Um, and so I just need my voters to make sure that they get out there and, for our other great candidates out there. And I, I just want to under, underscore what you just said by saying right now, from between now and Election Day, November 2nd, poll numbers should be the last thing you think about. If you feel like participating in the polls when they call you, please do so, listeners. Kind listeners of the SOTR Nation, hear me. Do not hesitate to participate in the polls. But when you see that this candidate or that candidate on the right is losing and there's just like a hopeless cause, don't pay attention to that. That's a voter suppression tactic that the Democrats have used successfully in individual congressional races across the country, most notably in Florida last election cycle. They depressed the vote there by, t they're, they're estimating 28,000 votes in a district down there by calling the race early. There's more data on mm -hmm. that. We're going to go into it on another program where I have more time to discuss it's a, it's research that I've, I've been able to read about how just the act of saying on the air early in the day at 12 o'clock polls are showing this candidate so far ahead of the other one a lot of people just say well you know what i could barely make it down there anyway there's no point in me voting i or if he's already lost there's no point in me voting for my guy and that's how you end up having your guy lose so you vote for the republicans down the ticket, especially for Shamed. Make, make sure to go to the website. And let's see. So the signs, where do we get the signs if we need them? That's a good question. Um, there's <laughs> about two or three different sort of nerve centers that the party has. Um, I, I think that the Missouri Republican Party kind of has their own headquarters. Um, Roy Blunt, I believe, is sharing a headquarters with Ann Wagner, um, down in uh, Valley Park area. Eric Schmidt has his own area. Um, I don't know if anybody's sharing with Eric, but that's that's kind of one of the issues that we have this year is that it's very decentralized, <laughs> um, which can be a good and a bad thing. Well, I'm going to be helping with that new office they're opening up in St. Charles. So um, absolutely. So for your signs, do you have a place where people can get yours? I don't. They can just go to my website or um, I'm going to be knocking on a whole bunch of doors in my district, just reconnecting with all my voters and getting them to get their signs out there. Um, well, I appreciate then, the Capitol report that you put out. I believe I'm in your district because I get that in the mail. So um, that's pretty cool. And I I just want to stress to everybody to, to, to vote because the, the veto session that you're talking about doing, that's the kind of work that I always hope I'm going to see from everybody. And I really appreciate you coming on. I'd like to have you come on again and update us on you. some of these things. It, it would be great. And um, thank you for coming on the Stacey on the Right Show. Thanks so much, Stacey. Glad to be here. Thanks, Glad Shaman. Thank you so much. Get more at 971talk.com.